Hi, I'm Todd Marvel with the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency. I'm also the chair of the Civil Engineering Committee of the Resource Conservation Challenges Scrap Tire Work Group. The Resource Conservation Challenge is a partnership between US EPA, state environmental agencies, industry, and academia. And our purpose is to promote the recycling and reuse of scrap tires and conserve energy and natural resources. The purpose of this DVD is to educate the public and stakeholders in both public and private civil engineering applications of the uses of tire derived aggregate in civil engineering applications. This DVD addresses a wide variety of issues related to the use of tire derived aggregate in civil engineering applications, including the five basic categories of civil engineering applications where TDA has been used, human health and environmental toxicology issues, and state regulatory issues. Several of the people appearing on this video are leading experts on this issue in the US, and we hope this video enlightens the viewer and increases your awareness and knowledge of the use of tire derived aggregate in civil engineering applications. The tires keep on coming. I mean, you know, your car right there, you have five tires, there's one in the trunk, and there has to be a use for the material. And so our goal was at that point is to try to find a marketplace for this rough shredded tire. It's a ubiquitous material already because of the number of tires generated. Anytime we can uh, use a substitute aggregate of some, some sort, then there's less mining going on. But right now it's waste tires and finding ways to integrate them into civil uh, engineering applications. Every cubic yard of tire derived aggregate has the equivalent of 75 passenger tires in it. an estimated 800 million scrap tires existed in stockpiles throughout the United States. But even now, as state scrap tire programs are working to reduce the backlog, every year in the U.S. alone, we generate approximately 300 million more scrap tires to be added to the market. So if we look at, you know, how, how many tires we produce in the U.S., uh, scrap tires we produce in the U.S. each year, we produce one tire per person. So we're, pushing, we're producing 380-some you know, tires a year. Improperly managed whole scrap tires accumulate rainwater and organic matter, creating an ideal breeding habitat for disease-carrying mosquitoes. In fact, the most commonly found mosquito lava in scrap tires in many parts of the United States, the northern house mosquito, is also the primary carrier of West Nile virus. The larvae of many other mosquito species found throughout the United States in improperly managed scrap tires are carriers of other diseases as well, including several forms of encephalitis. It is the link between scrap tire stockpiles and the proliferation of disease-carrying mosquitoes that is the primary reason states have created scrap tire management and cleanup programs throughout the United States. Back in the early 80s, uh, 84, I believe, uh, Minnesota was the first state in the nation to pass waste tire legislation mandating the recycling of tires. And, and back in the early 80s, there was no marketplace for the tires, the shredded tires. There was a, uh, a little bit of a fuel market, but it wasn't very well established. The use of tire drive aggregate was about zero uh, in, in 1990. Montanemi was doing a little bit of work in the state of Minnesota, uh, and a few other places were kind of dabbling with it but it really had not entered uh, the mainstream applications and it was clear we needed to find a beneficial use for this material and, and actually we need to find more beneficial uses for this material. Most of us are aware of another problem, the fire hazard posed by these stockpile accumulations. Air pollution is created during the burning phase of the fire and soil and water pollution happens during the firefighting phase from the resulting runoff from fighting the fire. As existing stockpiles are abated, civil engineering applications allow the beneficial use of scrap tires removed from the piles. I knew it was going to be a great thing for the environment uh, because certainly there had been major tire fires uh, and the potential for fires at sites that were scattered through by state of Maine as well as across the country were there. In 1999, I believe it is, we had our first major waste tire fire. 
um, and then two years later we had another one. From that there was a new um, bill passed which enforced uh, a $1 per tire, tire fee to help us clean up the tire piles in California and also find end uses for waste tires. What we've been able to do over the last couple of decades is to actually build the marketplace and a demand for the material where the DOTs and the county engineers and the uh, designers are actually saying this material can solve a problem we have in construction and solve it beneficially and cost effectively. Well, when we first started, uh, there had been no civil engineering application built, I mean, used in California. Uh, we built the first one in 2000 with about 660,000 tires. And to this date, uh, we've, we're using it, tires in about five or six different applications. And we're, we've used approximately three million tires in constructive civil engineering applications. Very quickly, it became clear we had a material that was very lightweight. Uh, so that can be used as a lightweight fill when you're trying to build highway embankments on top of weak ground such as soft clay or peat bogs. Uh, it also became clear that we had a material that high, had a high permeability. Uh, we thought that since rubber is a good insulator that it would be good insulating material. Uh, so you start combining those three base properties together uh, and, and we thought we had a real winning uh, material. Uh, and since then there's a fourth very important property and that's their a very good vibration damping material. Well, I, I put cost as, a, as, as another significant category of advantage. Uh, if you need one of the properties of the tire drive aggregate, uh, then it can be the most cost effective alternative. Environmental studies of TDA usage in both below grade and above grade applications reveal that TDA used in civil engineering applications does not have an adverse impact on human health and the environment. In fact, experts say although a few metals are released by TDA, the metals involved and the concentrations do not adversely impact groundwater or surface water quality or human health. Environmental regulatory agencies, rightly so, have asked, you know, what is the environmental effect of using tire drive aggregate? That was a very early question in Maine. Uh, so, w one of our first projects in 1993, uh, we specifically instrumented it so we could monitor uh, the quality of the water that had passed through tire drive aggregate. And then uh, that's been extended out to uh, several other studies uh, beyond that. Uh, and We've looked at tire drive aggregate uh, above the water table. That doesn't mean it's dry, so it's getting you know uh, infiltration from rain, rainwater, snow melt, and the and the like. Uh, and you get a little bit of iron that comes from the exposed steel belts, and a little bit of manganese, which is also a component of the steel belts. And that's about it. We've looked for metals. We've looked for organics. We've taken the water that has flown through the, the tire drive aggregate and put in two uh, test creatures. Uh, one is uh, a little crustacean called a Cyrodaphnia dubia, uh, and the other is a fathead minnow, uh, and they're both, both of those species were just fine, they were there, they reproduced, uh, life, life was good. Uh, and we've also uh, tested uh, tire drive aggregate below the water table, again you get some iron and manganese that comes off of the tires. Tiny, tiny amounts of organic compounds that if you were to go just two feet away into soil, uh, you, you basically cannot detect. Studies conducted at the University at Buffalo in New York also show negligible environmental impacts. I understand that you've been working with tire-derived aggregate here in septic system applications. Tell me a little bit about your project and what you started uh, with and how you've seen it progress. Yeah, we've been working almost 10 years to look at uh, the application of what we call tire-derived aggregate, which is nothing more than tires that are chipped up to sort of one to sort of two inch size, and replace stone which is the material conventionally used in the leach field part of these systems, which comprises typically of a septic tank and then a leach field, which distributes the sort of septic treated wastewater into the soil. You know, TDA has performed for us almost identically or better than stone in this application. And by that, I mean it provides the same level of treatment. It provides the same level of water distribution, which again are the two primary purposes of the stone. But it's also done that with essentially non detectable levels of environmental uh, loss and by that tires have exposed metals uh, that you uh, that are exposed during the processing and those sort of if you will dissolve during the use and they do leach metals 
but at very low concentrations, and we've done sampling of that in the water and in the soil below the trenches to see whether it migrates, and it does not. Tell me the process of the shredding of the tires. How does it end up looking like this shredded pile behind us? Um, as a society, we throw away approximately one tire per person per year. In Minnesota, we throw away about five and a half million tires. Those five and a half million tires, typically, when you get new tires put on your car, get left at the retailer store, and the retailer puts them in a bin, and, and we go on a weekly basis and collect those tires. The tires, when they get to our facility, they get evaluated for being uh, any life left as a tire, either for retreading or for reuse. And, and about 20 to 25 percent of those tires get resold as a tire. Uh, the other 75 to 80 percent of the tires get uh, shredded into our lightweight aggregate through a single pass shredding process and conveyed right into the open top trailers. The industry has evolved from the early 80s from where they had kind of rough uh, machinery to some pretty sophisticated, pretty heavy duty equipment for uh, using a slow speed shearing process to cut these tires from uh, with the steel belting in it from the, the whole tire into small pieces or into smaller pieces. We have uh, two different size pieces that we generally use. One's a 12 inch maximum size piece that we call type B, tire drive aggregate, uh, and that's used for lightweight fill applications. Then we have type A, which is three inch maximum size, and it would be type A that would be used for septic tank leach fields and some landfill drainage applications. Uh, other landfill drainage applications could be the larger uh, type, uh, type B material. The way states regulate TDA has a significant impact on its use in civil engineering applications. Some states regulate TDA destined for a civil engineering application as a commodity, like conventional construction materials. Therefore, the material does not require siting and a solid waste management permit. In this case, standards are put in place to ensure proper storage and maintenance. Other states regulate TDA as a solid waste and require siting and a solid waste permit for each project using TDA. In addition, in some states, the Department of Transportation specifications do not allow the use of TDA in roadway construction projects. However, many other states are increasingly changing those specifications to accommodate its use. You have a lot of tires here for storage. Explain to me some of the nuances of the, the issues around uh, tire aggregate storage. Yeah, we don't have any whole tire storage, but the aggregate we have stored are stored in, in bunkers, uh, concrete uh, bunkers that kind of define the size. And uh, our state regulations allow us to have 100 by 100 foot piles, 20 feet tall. You'll see the, the post showing the 20 foot tall markers. Uh, our state uh, fire marshal, although, says that uh, he's looking at this material as a byproduct and he would like to have 50 by 100 foot piles and only 10 foot tall. And basically he's saying since this is just uh, has no value that he would like to have this byproduct uh, guideline be the one being enforced. And, and so currently we're, we're stuck with two different uh, um, uh, rules and, and we're having to follow the more stringent one until we can uh, show our fire marshals that this material actually has a benefit and has engineers needing it and, and that it isn't just a byproduct, it's something that was produced and has demand for it. Do other states have the same issues? Other states have the same issues. Sometimes the configuration of the, the measurements of the piles are different, but the issues are the same as basically uh, uh, understanding the value of the material and understanding how the engineers, the end users want the material and allowing us to have enough material available so when the job happens, the material is available. Uh, a lot of our projects are in that 10 to 30,000 yard volume size and, and if you don't have the material available, the contractor needs it when he needs it. And, and nobody could supply it if we had to produce it on a day-by-day -day basis and keep these guys happy. So, uh, you know, some uh, uh, understanding of, of the need for the engineers has to be put into the storage requirements. 